Jake Shapiro is the executive director of the Public Radio Exchange um, and also affiliated with Berkman Center through the Fellowship Advisory Board. And Ellen Goodman is a profess professor at Rutgers University School of Law at Camden, as well as a fellow at the Center for Social Media at American University. Welcome. Thanks. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, the, the idea was to take a chance and jump into um, some discussions about public broadcasting as it becomes public media. As Amr mentioned, I've been involved in the Berkman Center for a long time, but my uh, day job um, is running PRX and the Public Radio Exchange is really one of a, 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 a number of new intermediaries that have emerged in public media. Um, we were started about seven years ago, and we operate as an online platform, an open system that lets anybody distribute work um, online as well as to local uh, radio stations. So it's an online marketplace um, on prx.org. Um, but we've also been very involved in a number of um, further innovations in sort of bringing uh, web and internet technology to the expansion of public broadcasting as it faces its own transitions and disruptions. Um, I've in the past tried each sort of semester or a couple semesters to give a kind of state of PRX discussion. Um, but rather than doing that today, I wanted to take advantage of uh, um, an opportunity to bring Ellen into the center because she has been working on um, some policy dimensions of where public media is headed. We found ourselves at a series of meetings in the past year, um, some through the Aspen Institute with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting as they try to chart internally um, some, some reform and uh, changes around uh, that institution, some through the Ford Foundation, which over the last five years has had this uh, reinventing public media initiative with a number of grantees. Um, PRX was one of those grantees. Um, and Ellen can talk a bit about what's coming next with, with the work that she's doing with Ford. Uh, and it also just seems like, the, you know, even in the last couple weeks, there's been more focus on this. The, the Knight Commission um, came out with its report on the um, sort of health of, uh, of communi community information. Um, the Columbia Journalism School, I think it was, uh, had the report that came around the yeah. future of journalism and had a section around um, public broadcasting. Um, last year's uh, Media Republic project that Persephone here spearheaded um, focused on, on this. Um, and actually, Ellen brought with her the Public Media 2.0 report. Um, there are a bunch of copies up here. That the Center for Social Media put out last year, which has a really interesting uh, digest and kind of cross-section of current innovations going underway and some analysis of what um, public media might look like in the future. Um, so the, the notion was to try to get into the, the broader story of public broadcasting transformation. But one of the things that I was using as kind of a hook was um, the, the, the phrase of the, the, you know, the new product that Google put out, Google Wave, and the task that the engineers had been assigned, which was essentially um, you know, if you had to invent email today as opposed to 40 years ago, what would it look like? That was their sort of task around creating that product. Um, and public broadcasting is 40 years old. Uh, the, the landscape has entirely changed. One of the things that I try to think about as we build PRX is what would you create today if you were trying to create a public media system? What, what is it that the country either needs or deserves? Um, what does the technology dictate? How are people operating in that? sphere? Do we need it at all as a, as a sort of tax-driven subsidy? Um, so those are some of the sort of set-up questions that, that prompted me to want to have a session here at Berkman that we would bring Ellen in to talk it through. So Ellen. Great. Okay. Um, so, so sort of foundational question, which, which we're not going to explore too much, is what do you mean by public media if you mean something more than public broadcasting? Um, before you could even begin to address that, I think you have to ask a prior question, which is, what is the purpose of public media? Um, and particularly in light of uh, uh, technological convergence, information abundance, um, a, a vastly more diverse public than existed 40 years ago in this country, uh, and, and participatory capabilities and new models of participatory creation of, um, uh, of media. Um, so we know what public broadcasting has been, and it's been easy to define based on FCC broadcast licenses and associated national <clears throat> structures. Um, public media is much harder to define. Like so much of the definitional project in telecommunications, we will have to arrive at a functional definition rather than a technological one uh, based on structure and protocols. And that's really the challenge here. Um, I think the challenge in inventing a new system of, of public media uh, is that it's not going to be defined by the broadcast platform. Um, 
public media presents a solution to many problems, and you're seeing that in these reports, especially the journalism crisis. Uh, also, it, it's being pointed to as a significant contributor to solutions in education, um, in inequality. Uh, these possibilities and underlying existential questions about what public media is um, arise and must address uh, a arise in and must address a particular policy context. Um, so I want to spend a minute on just framing this question about public media in the broader media policy context. Um, first is the broadband plan. As most of you know, the FCC is going to pr produce a broadband plan um, in February. And the idea is that it's, it's not just going to talk about things that, the F that are jurisdictional to the FCC, but make broad recommendations to Congress about our informational ecosystem um, and, and look 10 years out um, and, and make recommendations. Um, so in that context, regulators are asking how public media, uh, however it's defined, but let's just start with public broadcasting um, and, and related you know, uh, uh, ancillary broadband uh, services, how public media drives adoption um, of broadband and fulfills broadband public purposes. Uh, they're also asking, we're all asking, uh, whether net neutrality alone, so whether structural regulation um, can fulfill the public media mission. Do you still need to have um, uh, subsidies not only of uh, content, but a, a certain kind of networked um, and, and intentionally networked structure, the way that public media has been networked? Um, second of all, uh, the journalism crisis. So I don't need to say um, too much about that, except that all these reports sort of throw a, throw a bone to public media and say, and it, it's actually not obvious that they would do so because there's a historic tension between the journalism folks and the public broadcasting folks. Um, so for example, the Columbia School of Journalism, neither the Columbia School of Journalism nor the Knight Commission have ever been big fans of public broadcasting. And yet in both cases, in both these reports, they're arguing that um, public media may be part of the solution to the um, market failure, especially in accountability, with what the CSJ calls accountability journalism, uh, investigative journalism. Um, so third, uh, media ownership. Um, don't want to get into too much into the weeds on this one, but um, 2010 will be the year in which the FCC revisits its media ownership rules. And in that context, it will be asking questions. I think this commission in particular will be asking more sort of foundational questions about what do we mean by localism and diversity? How do we define that? Um, and in that context, there's a question about public media. What are their contributions, um, especially to localism, since public broadcasting stations really are um, the last major media enterprises that are locally owned in, uh, in communities. Um, finally, there are all the copyright debates about um, uh, rights and fair use. And I think it's especially interesting um, that the question of public media has been joined in some circles to the issue of Google Books and the Googleization of everything. And um, is there a role for a public archive? And, and um, what, what would it look like? And what would the terms of use be? Wow. Ah, there's one more, yes. Um, uh, can't forget spectrum, right? So, um, uh, so I've come up with this number of $100 billion tied up in TV spectrum, which is a, a pretty bogus number, but it's just extrapolated from the last, um, from the 700 megahertz auction of TV spectrum. Um, but in any case, it's a lot of money. 20% um, of that is in non-commercial television. Uh, and so um, it, it is likely that the broadband plan will, uh, will suggest, or at least allude to the possibility um, that the, the, the spectrum shortage that we experience in broadband could be solved by reallocating a bunch of the television spectrum. And that obviously implicates the non-commercial television spectrum. Um, and, it's, and as I'll get to later, um, the, the linkage between public media and the broadcast spectrum and a broadcast um, tower um, is problematic in many respects and, and um, calls into question this, the whole structure, the 1960s structure that we have for public media. Um, but when the time comes, and it may come sooner rather than later for the FCC to really examine TV spectrum policy, it will affect uh, these discussions about um, the purpose of public media. Um, so to begin this, this conversation that I hope um, will be um, dynamic about uh, what the mission of public media is, 
Um, we can look at public media as, and I think many people do, as Nova, Frontline, Big Bird, all things considered, um, and wonder what it's about. What, what, what unites, what, what is all this about, and what should it be about in a broadband, mobile, participatory media space? Um, but I think what's interesting is that if you go back, as I will in a moment, to the 67 Act, um, the original vision for public broadcasting was surprisingly contemporary um, and surprisingly innovative uh, in that um, it was not just about particular kinds of content that, that you know, serving the underserved and, and um, with particular kinds of underproduced content, um, but was really about um, uh, uh, three other things. Just go pull them all up. Um, outreach, access, uh, and engagement. So let me tell you what, how I see those. Um, so these are quotes from the Act um, that the public broadcasting system was supposed to um, uh, provide um, delivery technology, foster technologies for the delivery of public telecommunications services. And even that term, um, there's lots of talk about television and radio broadcasting, but there's also this discussion about public telecommunications services, which was a broader category. Um, so access was one value. Um, outreach, which is something that uh, public broadcasting has not done all that much of until recently, and um, uh, there is now, and I think CPB has sort of championed this notion that outreach and engagement, so democratic engagement, um, some people call it, uh, increasingly has to be at the core of what of, of the programming and the other services that public media does, not as something that's tacked on afterwards. Um, and that can be traced to the, to the 67 Act, which is that what these guys are supposed to be doing is exploiting their local presence, their, their presence in a community, um, and reaching out to that community uh, and networking individuals to community resources. Um, so embedded in that notion is not just reaching out proactively, um, but also sort of being a clearinghouse, not only of their own content, but of community resources. Uh, and I'll develop that point in a second. <coughs> and then finally, related to outreach is this notion of, um, of engagement. So it, in this quote, you see a lot of the content <coughs> stuff, which is mostly what we what we, I think, focus on, diversity and excellence, creative risks, addressing the needs of underserved and, and uh, unserved audiences, particularly children and minorities. Um, I, but um, I, I think the idea of being responsive to local and general interests combined with the idea of outreach um, supports this notion of uh, uh, engagement, public engagement, not just a push um, a sort of content push uh, model, which is obviously um, easier to do today than it was with 20th century broadcast technology. So I think the most optimistic way to look at the 67 Act, maybe the most productive way to look at it in our context, is that it's, um, uh, its eyes were bigger than its stomach. You know, it, 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 was, it was imagining a system that really couldn't be effectuated with broadcast technology, um, but could conceivably be effectuated with broadband technology. Um, and so uh, what we're trying to do through this project with Ford is figure out sort of how would you effectuate it? What are the function, what are the structures that need to be created to effectuate it? And what are the functions that um, these structures ought to be geared towards supporting. And right now, um, uh, the, the baskets um, that we've come up with, and these are, this is in a sense a sort of functional reinterpretation of those um, 67 Act principles, um, is that what public media, um, however it's defined, and let's just for our purposes define it as uh, non-commercial media makers um, with a mission, a public service mission. Um, I, platform neutral, technology neutral, um, that what they should be doing is creating content where that, that, are, that falls into some category of public goods or market failure. Um, they should be curating content uh, either that's their own, so archival materials, um, or that's a platform for third party materials. Um, and they should be connecting information and content. And I'm, I'm increasingly um, uh, 
not using, instead of using the word content, thinking more about the word narratives, um, whether it's journalistic narratives or uh, uh, fictional narratives, um, long form documentary narratives. But if you think about the value that we're talking about and really the value where there may be a market failure, where you're not going to have sort of crowdsourced citizen journalism, you are talking about constructed narratives. Um, so narratives and, and information, which, which could be raw information. Um, connecting individuals in their communities to that, um, to that information and narratives. And now, Jake, you're going to talk about what that means. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, sure. And we, we were thinking that we might dive into some real examples, but rather than jump on the web and do that, it, the, the fact is actually there's been quite a lot of experimentation and innovation in the field in the last couple of years that fall into these kinds of categories of, of creating, connecting, and curating. Um, certainly, you know, PRX itself has sort of taken this as our approach to things, um, being very much an open network. The curatorial role being one that I think is a powerful possibility. It's certainly inherent in some of how stations operate currently. They select programs to put on their air. They're curating from abundance of content and choosing things that they think connect locally to their communities. Um, but given the opportunities on multiple channels, um, that curatorial role can really be expanded um, we did a, a project last year that I may have talked about here then, which was funded out of a CPB initiative where it tied together a number of investments in um, public media groups working on covering the campaign, the election in um, 2008. And we did one called Ballot Vox with a V, um, where we had, uh, it was an experiment. The, the experiment was to do a pure curating uh, challenge where um, we had five editors whose sole job it was uh, to go out and sift through Flickr photos and YouTube videos and blog posts and the forums on sites that were unexpected, like the, you know, we, we found a particularly ripe um, discussion around the election on the forums on the American Idol website, you know, the off-topic forums. So like, you have all the topical forums around each contestant, and then there's the off-topic forums. Some of the best discussions on the campaign were there, and the experiment was to go in with a couple of lenses, a journalistic lens, and a kind of quality lens for the kinds of things that you might actually want to pull out and present on somebody else's website or to somebody who wasn't doing the digging um, and seeing if you could create something compelling. Because I think often we're falling into the notion that we have to create the spaces where people upload their user-generated content, or we have to create yet another social network for that all to happen. But there is a role, and we, we tested it out there, of, of going in with a purpose and sort of intentionally trying to pull some of that stuff out. Um, now, there, there's an example, um, another ambitious example in Chicago is a service called Vocalo, uh, and one worth looking into, where Chicago Public Radio took as its challenge that its core radio service um, was really only um, serving a part of the audience, and that the, there's many people, either by demographic reasons or local reasons, should be tuning in and, and using their service but weren't. And rather than create um, one more, um, you know, format that's a familiar public radio one, they decided to, to really be ambitious and create something that was a hybrid between a web site and a radio station where most of the programming would be contributed by listeners who were recording things locally and sifting and, and uploading to the site, and that the radio program itself would be essentially curated. That They'd have DJs who, instead of spinning music, um, were spinning these kinds of narratives um, and short documentaries. And um, it's worth tuning into. It's still early on in its evolution, but it's an example of, I think, many other um, efforts that are underway, um, seeded in, and sometimes by CPB and other funders and locally that fall into these domains. And I think one of the challenges that we're now up against is that we're three to four to five years into a pretty fervent um, round of experimentation in the system, and then we're now trying to figure out where any of these things actually can scale or can actually break through what I think is some real barriers to both perception and reality around public broadcasting as a whole. Um, not necessarily living up to its aspirations in this domain. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the case four. Okay, yeah, so now let's um, spend a minute on, um, uh, we'll, we'll get to in a moment kind of where public media um, leaders and entities, and I, I am talking inclusively not only about public broadcasters, but um, uh, sort of organizations like Bayback. I don't know if you've heard of that, but that's a Bay Area. Um, Bay Area Video Coalition. Yeah. Bay and, Area and Video CCTV Coalition. And CCTV would be another one. Here yeah, so a lot of, um, so so public access, community um, media centers. LPFMs. That, LPFMs that, um, you know, entities that think of themselves as being part of public media, 
um, are all sort of joining in, and this, this um, AU study um, has a very expansive, more expansive than, than my definition of, um, of public media. Um, uh, th there's a lot of movement to try to figure out where it should go. Um, and it all depends on making a case for public media um, because the case against public media is quite strong and quite widely held. Um, so let's start with the case for public media. And all of these um, need a hell of a lot more research and sort of articulation. Um, I think surprisingly, given how long public broadcasting has been around, um, it's actually hard to find really good literature um, to, uh, uh, to defend these in anything more than, than theory. So um, the classic uh, justification for um, public subsidies is that there are market failures. Um, that's why we fund basic research, scientific research, and that's why maybe we should fund um, uh, basic media production, whatever we think of as being basic. Um, now, in the broadcast world, um, there were obvious market failures, even with respect to sizable pockets of consumer demand, right, because of the mass audience model. So that um, uh, who were these underserved audiences that the Carnegie Commission report and the Public Broadcasting Act were thinking of? Well, they included, you know, quite large bodies of the population, um, children, um, uh, ethnic minorities, and also taste minorities, right, and not necessarily um, low-income taste minorities, but, all, all, you know, in, in fact, people who liked, you know, um, opera or, dra or certain kinds of drama could not find what they wanted on the commercial airwaves because they weren't significantly, rep they weren't represented in significant mass. Um, now, that's all changed, and in the long-tail environment, the question is, where are there still market failures? Um, uh, in terms of satisfying existing consumer demand, um, are, is there a, still a need to provide certain kinds of content or curate content um, that's of interest to particular uh, minority or taste groups or, or um, ethnic minorities, language minorities, uh, demographic minorities, et cetera? Um, and that's a very contested um, question. Um, I think it's quite clear that there are. Um, and having just come from um, WGBH, they make an awfully um, compelling case um, uh, for things like historical um, documentaries, um, uh, that if you were to leave to the market all of the history-making function, the only thing that you would have would be World War II um, videos, because mm -hmm. that's the only kind of history that the market um, supports. But, but that you can, you can imagine the richness of that conversation. Second. Um, the, the second argument would be uh, non-market objectives, sort of public goods like journalism, um, that there really never has been a market for uh, accountability journalism. There never will be one, but it's really important for our democracy. Um, and that you don't need a lot of consumption of it, right? So when Frontline does a documentary on the um, um, war in Afghanistan, um, all you need is one phone call from the administration to say that it was, they cared about it when they had their meeting on the strategy for the war in Afghanistan to know that the accountability journalism was doing its job, even if no one else is really paying attention. Um, and then the third uh, category is a little bit, um, uh, third justification is a little bit more ambiguous, and I think maybe the most fruitful and interesting today, which is... Um, really does public media serve an institutional functions, particularly in communities, um, around uh, convening, um, real space convening, also virtual convening, facilitating certain kinds of debates, discussions, um, being a safe space for discourse that's not part of the um, sort of talk radio uh, uh, polemic, polarized polemic. Um, capacity building uh, in terms of um, building uh, uh, building capacity to tell narratives um, uh, and also some of the proposals now almost border on social services so for example um, this this proposal uh, for a, a geek core or a youth tech core uh, to, to take um, uh, particularly low-income teenagers and bring them into public media and then send them out into their communities to be both um, uh, sort of uh, promote digital literacy, promote media literacy, um, promote connections. That's the case for public media, that those are all three important functions and, and we need them and we still need them. Okay, now the case against um, public media we're all familiar with and some of them are quite compelling. Um, to some extent, they look at the existing public broadcasting system and note its failures. 
Um, so as good of a job as it's done, as important as some of its moments have been, um, I think there's widespread agreement that uh, it has never really had serve a public service mission at its core, um, at its, or it, at least if it was at its core, it was distorted um, by the pledge drive model and the need to produce programming that would um, appeal to the highest, to the pledgers. Um, that has never been sufficiently diverse. Um, and that uh, as, as management of public broadcasting stations has grade, um, the, the, they have been content with reaching their own demographic, um, and, and especially when that demographic are, are, is contributing. Um, second, that it's just not relevant anymore. This is the abundance of information, sort of long tail. Um, argument that uh, it made sense when there were three networks. It doesn't make sense now. Everything that you want, you can find. Um, I think it's in tension with the market failure argument, or at least those two need to be squared um, uh, and, and reconciled. Um, and then finally, uh, sort of a, an institutional argument that even if everything, um, e even if public broadcasting had all the best motivations and intentions and were properly oriented, um, the fact is the institutions um, are not properly structured. And just to give you an example um, where I think this is a valid point, where public broadcasting stations are part of state universities, um, they are often, uh, the, the, the station leadership gets picked just like a professor would get picked, right? It gets picked out of the, by the communications department. Um, the board is the, or the board of overseers of the university. In other words, these are not media people. The station is not their principal um, product or their um, uh, station performance is not their, pr their particular um, principal goal. Uh, and so when you have institutions like that, they're just not um, well suited for the, for the goals that we're talking about. And then there's all the politics and we can, that's sort of self-explanatory. Do you want to do this one? Yeah, I mean, we'll just jump through these, but the, you know, I think part of the interesting thing is to think about what are the inherent strengths that the public broadcasting as it becomes public media already has that are well mapped or well suited to the current transition in the digital landscape. Um, some of those being actually the, the mission itself um, really carries through and across, I think, some of this moment of um, real openness and, and change in business models. Uh, and the public service mission ends up driving that. Clearly, there's some really valuable national brands. Um, anybody trying to map over to a new media system that has brands that have real trust, trust being you know inherent under that as one of the values, um, a very important piece of the puzzle. The decentralized network um, you'll see is also a weakness, but it's a uh, you know it's it's a uh, it is a unique feature of the U.S. public broadcasting system that it isn't run like the BBC. It's not some centralized organization. Each of these institutions, and there are hundreds of them, are run individually. Um, and they do think of themselves as a system and as a network and behave that way, um, but it's not centralized. Um, there are sizable audiences. Uh, public radio reaches about 30-something million people a week. Um, well, I don't remember public television's audi uh, audience numbers, but it's, it's higher than that. Um, th those are audiences that have been relying on and seeking out that service. Um, it's not the entire country, but it's a large group to base something on. Uh, the local presence is again, especially in institutional terms, a unique feature. There's a station in every community, or at least you know, in many geographic locations across the country. Um, the, the narrative skills that I think is the right word for it, the sort of storytelling, content creation capacity is, is actually really powerful. It's, it's uh, threaded throughout. I think you'll find remarkably creative producers at the national and local organizations whose um, skills are now um, evolving to be digital storytellers in a way that I think um, in the public service realm means that there's some advantages that are ready to be grasped. Um, diversified funding, uh, you'll see actually Ellen gets into some of the, the, the numbers here. Um, you know, it's not, even though CPB, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, is a major vehicle for, for taxpayer dollars into the system, uh, there's actually quite a number of sources of funding. So pledge drives and contributions from users and listeners and viewers. Um, advertising in the guise of sponsorship and underwriting, but sometimes really genuinely sponsorship by local businesses and national purveyors, uh, and then some other monetization across other kinds of content distribution. On the weaknesses side, uh, these are all fairly obvious ones. Um, the resources really are constrained. I mean, you're talking about a pretty large system that has very thin margins. There's not a lot of risk capital. There's very little money in R&D. 
Um, there's, not, um, there's not room to really evolve beyond some of the core models that have driven the current success to be able to slingshot into the next domain. Uh, to the extent that we have these powerful positive brands, there are some real negative brand associations too. There are plenty of people who think they know what NPR and PBS mean and have dismissed it or have decided it's not relevant to their lives um, and assume that there's nothing beyond that available to them. And, you know, public radio reaches 10% of the radio listening audience. Some of that 90% that doesn't listen just hasn't discovered it yet, um, hasn't tuned in, doesn't land on that part of the dial. But some of that has, uh, those folks have listened and don't like it and doesn't, don't think it speaks to them and are not coming back anytime soon. And, you know, even as we try to in, in leverage the brands we have, we have to realize that that um, can be a downside. And it interestingly goes back to the Vocalo example where they tried to start a completely new brand in Chicago. Um, the decentralized network is a weakness, you know, as we're trying to foster some of these kinds of reforms and changes and discussions. Uh, the, the herding of cats phenomenon is powerful. Um, the local rootedness and the institutional kind of inertia that's built up around that is intense. Um, I think there's an interesting feature that is not well explored, which is the broadcast culture itself. The, uh, you know, I've been increasingly thinking that um, there was amazing pioneering work done in broadcast in over decades, and broadcast engineers who figured out how to move content around and get their towers optimized and build master control systems and understand, you know, the contours of radio signals and a huge amount of that work is done and the engineers who help do that are in many cases the leadership of the system. Uh, they are not part of the new engineering which is around the web. One thing that we've worried about in, at PRX and we talked about with NPR and Public Interactive is in a field that maybe employs something like 18,000 people as a whole my, my guess is that there's under 100 people who are full-time code writers, software developers, uh, people who actually are the new engineers for the new space. Uh, so it's a, it's a very thin pool within the field who really and is a sort of an inherently get the structure of what the technology is now bringing. Um, and then this lack of diversity in new talent, there really isn't much of a pipeline or hasn't been. We're seeing some encouraging signs on that um, in different facets of the system where we're now opening up um, channels for training, um, creating the possibility for multicast where instead of having just one channel, we now have several, we can now actually use that as a place to showcase new programming and new content rather than just porting over the same stuff. Uh, but that in, traditionally has actually been a real uh, stopgap kind of problem of really not cultivating any new talent in the system. So. Let's um, let's skip Should, this one. Yeah, okay. Um, we'll, we'll come back to this hopefully in discussion, and yeah, maybe Mark, you can along. talk too about um, you know how to build on these strengths and what's kind of in the pipeline to build on the strengths. Um, so the next one Whoa. is that um, so as you might imagine, you know projects that would build on strengths. Um, as you think about all these broadcast engineers and why there aren't more code writers. Um, Federal support in the system um, is overwhelmingly uh, uh, overwhelmingly resides in broadcasting, um, and by law it must go to support broadcasting. And it's a real, it's the I think the fundamental structural problem um, with the system. So the appropriations and and they're very meager. And I'm sure you've heard the, comp the international comparisons. How little. We spend on public media, just to give you um, one comparison, it's about $1.70 per person in the U.S. Um, it's about $200 in the U.K. per household, slightly different measure. Um, uh, but uh, you get a sense of the magnitude. In any case, um, those appropriations, we'll get to in a second, how the lion's share of them are going to broadcasting stations. Um, and uh, of the money that's going to broadcasting stations, the lion's share of that is going for sort of broadcasting infrastructure and transmission. Um, other assets that aren't usually, aren't necessarily thought of, um, the, the reserve spectrum itself, right, the spectrum asset is obviously a broadcasting asset. Um, and then there are these special copyright provisions, which in a way are not so much a public subsidy as a mandatory private subsidy, so they're copyright owners that must, under a compulsory license or under um, uh, sort of um, uh, a, 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 an outright grant, um, copyright um, rights grant, um, must sort of give public broadcasters a break when using their material. 
but only or arguably only, depending on how you interpret the language, when they're broadcasting it, right? So when they're streaming it and they're using it for um, in, in uh, broadband applications, they don't get the benefit of these copyright licenses. Um, so all of these are incentives to stay in broadcasting um, and, and sort of disproportionately support broadcasting and broadcasters. Next one. Budget. Yeah. Um, so this just gives you a, this is the um, CPB 2009 budget. Um, that big gold section are TV station grants. Um, the purple one, the 62,000, 62 million, um, is, uh, is radio station grants. And um, everything else is sort of other stuff. The other significant one is the 71 million. Um, that is uh, TV programming. So that is really um, when CPB, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, when CPB wants to do something really innovative, right, and support some sort of digital initiative, it, it's coming out of either that blue slice or the radio programming, the, the what would you call that? Aqua? <laughs> the 28 million um, slice. The, the other stuff is kind of um, already spoken for. It's, it's essentially a federal entitlement to... Um, the broadcast station. So you see how very little of the CPB funding is, is kind of um, discretionary and can be used for really innovative things. Um, Although there's yeah. this, so there, why don't you, well, you well, and, and um, they do, there are additional appropriations above and beyond the budget that can occur and there's stories behind them which we won't delve into but that is currently actually where some of the funding for more innovation on the digital front is happening. For example under the digital conversion green slice the money over the number of years now that had been going to pay for the transition to digital broadcasting, so for the hardware for TV and radio to transition to HD, um, you know, that money was specially appropriated by Congress above and beyond the usual budget to help pay for that transition. As the hardware needs have declined because the transition is complete, um, we've effectively been able to use the, the ongoing appropriation around content and services. So projects like um, PRX has gotten some funding from there. The NPR Argo project is getting some funding from there, which is an interesting one to track. Um, the American Archive, which is a, a very big, ambitious project of digitizing and making available past public broadcasting content from stations, um, is getting funded through there. Uh, and this is actually currently one of these um, balls in the air that, that we're all trying to figure out how it will land, because that's where some of the opportunity is for expanding the definition of what public media could be doing. Um, and the other slices here are the Ready to Learn project, which I don't know much about, but if it comes up, it can be discussed. And then this interconnect, um, in this case it's radio, but every decade or so, Congress does another appropriation to pay for the satellite interconnection systems for television and for radio, which have been the backbone for the distribution for broadcast content. Um, so the, typically when you're hearing all things considered on a station, live, it's being beamed out to outer space over the satellite and sent back on to all these transponders and stations. This pays for that, and it's been the broadcast interconnect system. And there's an interesting question about whether there's a similar or analogous digital interconnect that we should be trying to frame up for a next request sometime down the, down the line. Um, all this, th that entire slice, if you then go to look at the entire industry, uh, you know, the CPB is now only 14% of what is, at, at some best estimates, a $2.85 billion public broadcasting industry-wide um, economy. Uh, and what's interesting to think about is how much that CPB portion is really leveraging or sort of the linchpin of some of this other funding. Uh, this includes subscribers really means um, contributors and members and donors and pledgers. Um, business uh, it also includes things like underwriting and sponsorship. A lot of state and local funding, a lot of philanthropy. Um, these, some of these universities and colleges that can be obstacles are also very, very often supporting um, public broadcasting. And as a whole, that ends up being the full pie. So we'll try to wrap up here. Yeah. We need some time for. Okay. So, um, in fact, let's make let's make this the last slide. Um, uh, one of the interesting things about this interconnect system, that was very revolutionary when it was created, and 
Um, it's important to remember something I think we may have lost sight of, which was that public broadcast, you see this in the act, public broadcasting was meant to, and for, for a long time was, and in some ways still is, um, very technically innovative. Um, it was supposed to be experimental, and, and it was supposed to be cutting edge, and the interconnection system in its time was just that. Um, and so it is interesting to think about what that would mean today and where you would want. And I think the C that small slice of CPB funds, one of the reasons it's so important, it's leveraging all those other funds. It's, it's the subject of matching funds from a lot of other institutions. Um, it's also the institution that is most likely, um, or should be most likely, the CPB to take chances and to incubate um, sort of, you know, new business models, new te technologies, um, new genres. And there have been moments in the history of public broadcasting where that's really happened. Um, and I would definitely add that to sort of part of the mission orientation of public media. Okay, so what would we need to do um, to um, sort of play up the, weak, the, the strengths that um, Jake identified? Um, this is just um, my list, and I think what's not on here is number five, which was other. Um, <laughs> Right, um, that off. So um, I, I think we need to redefine the entitlement to CPB funding so that it's not principally, it's not um, Jake gets CPB funding and he's not a broadcaster, so it's not only broadcasters that get it, but, um, uh, but the lion's share is going to broadcasting and the copyright laws are also um, oriented around um, broadcasting. So I think um, we need to do that. Uh, we also need... Um, relatedly to make the flow of funding much more transparent. Um, and transparency, I think, is a value that we, we could talk about in many ways in journalism and public media, um, how public media does journalism maybe as a hallmark of what is part of its mission to be transparent. Um, I, three, that's sort of one and two. Um, three here uh, is what you've, what you've long heard, and I, I've sort of given up hope for this, but um, uh, we ought not to be annually appropriating funds for um, public broadcasting, public media. There ought to be some other funding mechanism, um, namely a trust fund or some sustained, politically insulated um, uh, funding source. Um, for the, the copyright laws that relate to public broadcasting need to be updated along with the, um, with the 67 Act. Um, that's on the policy side. Maybe what belongs in number five, other is all the private sector um, reforms. And I think, so I'm working with the Ford Foundation. I think that the funding community um, needs reforming in terms of what, what they support and, and um, uh, how they even define public media and what, values, what value they find in it. Um, and also, obviously, in the, um, uh, in the field, um, there are many ways in which public broadcasting entities um, and in other incumbent sort of um, uh, long-standing public media entities don't collaborate, um, are not open, uh, and, um, uh, and therefore do not leverage the, the, the meager resources that they have very effectively and aren't sufficiently diverse and um, really don't have public service at their, at their core. So I'll stop there. Great. I will skip this next step slide. Well, you guys will figure out the next steps. <laughs> so, um, I mean, part of what, what Ellen was saying is that we're actually in a moment of sorts, so f the, through Ford's work, but also CBB internally, and then the, at the FCC just appointed somebody to be taking on some of these media uh, investigations. There really does feel like we have an arc of time in the next year or two or three where some of these issues are going to come to a head. So um, we're trying to get a handle on it. Let's discuss. Mark, was there anything that we threw in there that uh, was off? completely off uh, the, when we got to the numbers part? <laughs> well, um, uh, uh, nothing of, you know, I mean, basically, I think you had it right. I, I think the interconnection build out numbers, you were actually looking at one fiscal year right. uh, appropriation. Uh, just so you know, the, on a, mm -hmm. the last cycle around public television's interconnection system was $120 million, uh, and that was just completed, and that's still being built. And then radio, public radio's interconnection system was in the 70 million, 70, 70 million, 70 million, I think. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, and the appropriation usually occurs over multiple years, and I believe that was uh, the last year of that, um, of that appropriation. It's a 10-year cycle, which means by the time public radio and public television finished building what they got funded, they're starting to work on the design and implementation of the next round, 
and you usually start working with Congress about two to three years out from when they will actually appropriate because you have to sort of remind them of this and get them prepared for it and get them thinking about it. But they have never uh, demurred from the, from the fact that they have a responsibility to do this. Um, as I was saying to Jake, one of the goals I sort of put on the table for myself is can we get public radio and television in a room and just build one interconnection? <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. I'm just a wild-eyed optimist, <laughs> but um, I, I think there are a lot of opportunities there. But those are otherwise, I think the numbers are pretty close. Okay. The other thing is on the on the, the chart showing how those monies are spent, um, CPB's appropriation. Um, those are all stipulated by the Act. So even the dollars that show us having some, you know, discretion, which comes after we pay the royalty fees and other things for both public radio and television relative to the, some of the, the uh, copyright issues and other things, we have about $10 million discretionary funds at the corporation to be able to do things. Uh, the beauty of the digital um, appropriation, which was initially funded as a hardware program to help public radio and television move into the digital broadcast world, we have uh, been slowly and but, but steadily moving this into content and um, service type investments, which include things like the American Archive, but we've used money with Jake around um, uh, iPhone applications for NPR, and there are there are a lot of uh, innovative things being developed, and we expect the fund that will, I hope, help to begin to deal with some of the questions around collaboration and sharing of content across platforms and um, making the content or, um, uh, available to people, they'll understand what the business rules are, they can use it through structures like APIs and through appropriate metadata tagging of this content. So we're making investments in that area. But otherwise, we really have very limited discretion. I don't know if this is useful or not, but I was really struck by your presentation when you described the way that uh, people understand market failure in the production of content. Um, and then you had in a separate piece the curation idea as a mission. So um, why don't you describe this as a market failure in curation? Mm -hmm. Because it seems like, I mean, everybody's excited about the Internet. I'm excited about the Internet. Here we are at the Berkman <laughs> Center, excited about the Internet. Um, but, right, I mean, you know, when you have people putting content on things like YouTube, um, you know, the, the advertising supported model, obviously, um, even though, you know, it doesn't seem curated or it's curated algorithmically and on some pages it says, a computer created this for you, there's still obviously biases. I mean, it's, it's difficult maybe for the user to understand what they're not able to find um, because they can't find it, right? But I mean, if you look at the behavior of the main portals like YouTube or something like that, um, the way that they, you know, make these agreements with certain um, well-known producers like, you know, EMI or NBC and, and then the way that they um, direct hits back to those producers, I mean, this seems like a great parallel to 1960, right? When you have a small number of of television stations that are corporately owned. And similarly, I mean, the, the growth in Hulu or, or these other kinds of systems, they actually seem quite parallel to, to the arguments from the 1960s. So I, I wonder why curation is so separate in your argument. Um, well, I actually don't think, I, I did focus on the market failure um, argument in the context of, of content categories creation, but I think you have to make it in all three categories. Why are there why do we need pu to publicly subsidize connection, right? Why can't why can't market or non-market forces connect people to information? It's there. If they want it, they can find it. Um, and I think it's though they, it has to be articulated um, about why people may not be able to find the information that they want. Now there, it's sort of easy to see. Well, there are educational problems, there are um, broadband problems, there are access problems. Um, I think maybe the toughest place and the most interesting place is curation, right? So that it has to be linked to our concern about Google and commercial platforms, commercial curation, commercial archiving um, as a sort of subcategory. So there's search, um, there's archiving, um, you know, and then there's the editorial. There's the sort of intentional mm -hmm. editorial, not algorithmic, but editorial function. And I think there's probably market failures in all of those areas. But you're saying you don't have the evidence, so you don't, well, there's no... I don't no... think the case has been made effectively. Okay. Uh, well, I like to... to think that we may have turned that corner and that a lot of content delivery is being done not so much via the satellite system shut up the sky back down to transponders and stuff. 
being done online. The, the, the public radio delivery system in Content Depot is very much that. You probably know from this too, but um, I don't know how much we're still relying on uh, the satellite system that's in the sky. I mean, I know the goal one day is to bring that thing down and not have to use it because it's costly. And then all we have to do is keep robust computer lines and, and connect everyone. And, and that seems to be where it's going. I mean, we may have turned the corner. Well, there, there is an economy of delivering a simultaneous signal to eight, nine hundred thousand locations at once. Right. The satellite becomes an extremely effective yeah, right, price right, right. to be able to do that. Um, so I think you need to look at that. The other, the other question as you begin to look at access and, and use of content uh, is uh, broadcast is a uh, is little the, the democracy, really a, a democratic way to deliver things. All you need is an inexpensive TV and antenna, right. and you can have it, and you don't have to pay anything, and it doesn't, you, you have access to information. And so, without any rate for broadband, we're guarantees every household has a, has a you know, broadband connection, and, and not, a, not a kilobit, a series of kilobits, but a broadband, a real broadband right. connection. Let's use a European definition, maybe, rather than an American definition. Um, Hmm. Um, is is television still and digital television which can deliver it is data to off the air devices um, still a uh, a player in this environment? So we have a question up here. Uh, actually, two, but they're related, I guess. Uh, you, when you're you're looking obviously at a blooming buzzing confusion out there of all the things going on, people trying to you said do you see much going on with regard integrating with with print and whatever print means as we go forward I mean you know I on the way here walked by the Harvard bookstore and they printed me a book you know it took about 10 minutes uh, and then the, the other the second question is is it's obviously for obvious reasons you're you know, a lot of focus on the output but are you, are you doing much work on the input ie uh, news gathering Mm -hmm. What's going on that way in this world, and, and maybe across from this world to the print world? I think there there are some things underway in um, print, or at least text, um, yeah, okay. and and yeah, writing, and that kind of journalistic enterprise that um, hadn't previously been part of public broadcasting's set of activities, but are now very much so. Certainly, you know, station sites, networks, national producers have all been building in that capacity to their own web expression, sort of doing blogging, doing text, doing articles, doing the, the sort of companion pieces to the audio video that they're producing. And then we've seen recently, just a few weeks ago, the, the partnership that's emerging in San Francisco between KQED, the public broadcaster, and a journalistic enterprise that's actually going to be partnering to include, I think, actually broadsheet print yeah. output um, inserted in the New York Times regional edition. And you know a, a few more experiments like that underway. On the on the input side, the investment in journalism is definitely now starting to finally, I think, happen. Um, there's surprisingly thin resources in the local reporting capacity across public broadcasting. A lot of public television stations have zero newsroom capacity, and then public radio has some real investments in local news gathering, um, but probably only at several dozen stations that have any notable newsroom um, sense. I mean, we, we're sort of used to it here in Boston because we have yeah. some strong stations that have them, but right. if you look at the job, drops off a clip, clip pretty fast around the rest of the country where there's often just one reporter or none, um, but there's been some new attempts on both the digital front, a project that NPR has begun called Argo um, as an experiment to partner with about a dozen stations um, to create specific sites around topics and, um, you know, paying for a new um, position that would be a journalist blogger associated with that, trying to then both aggregate and be a partner to other local news resources and then create a presence around a particular content vertical. And then the CBB has been funding something or just is now selecting grants um, around something called the Local Journalism Centers, LJCs, in the latest um, of our long list of acronyms, where stations have been proposing regional collaborations between stations as well as with third parties. Um, and it's, it's sort of in, a, in the same vein, I guess, as the, as the Argo project, but um, with a different slice across public radio. And, you know, that, that actually should bear some fruit. It seems like NPR in particular has been taking a lead on saying that, that it's a intentionally going to try to build local journalistic capacity at stations, not just on the national level. Great. Just say Argo is a joint funded project 
with the Knight Foundation. Uh, Knight Foundation, CPB's got significantly oh. more invested in the Knight, but it's a yeah. partnership. And NPR's got money, and News Hours involved as well, trying to build this journalism, journalistic capacity. Uh, the LJCs, local journalism centers, really uh, could add more capacity uh, regionally, so we could see it in the Southwest yep. uh, focusing on immigration across the border states and and the, the South, um, and you know, they could be focusing on health related issues in um, the Midwest. They could be focusing on agri agribusiness, those types of things. Um, and as we start to make these investments, both in Argo and in the local journalism centers, uh, these are two-year projects, and one of the things we done, the reason we did them over two years, funded them that way, was there was a sustainability requirement. So that gives the the collaborators on these projects time to secure uh, sustainable funding so when our funding ends, which it inevitably will, um, that they have funds coming in. So these new reporters, these are new reporters, not existing ones, will be able to will remain and continue. Anybody else? Somebody hmm. that was raised there. Go ahead, okay, Dan. So, um, question for Jake and uh, anyone else who wants to chime in, maybe. But um, I come from the bizarro parallel world of public access, <laughs> where we've spent 30 years doing user-generated content right. and trying to broadcast with 10 times as many stations, but a much smaller individual reach. And all the things that I hear brought up in terms of new public media are the same things we've been struggling with, moving towards, moving away from being focused on our specific cable casting role. And I was curious uh, if you see a role in the new public media that expands beyond traditional broadcast into these entities that serve an even more hyper-local focus, have for 30 years been doing citizen journalism, user-generated content, let's put the equipment in the hands of the people, and now are actually struggling to create the things public media has done so well, which is networking the stations to take advantage of the distributed funding and talent base. Right. So we'd love to get your thoughts on that. I mean, I, I certainly hope that that's the case. It's, you know, I think that there has been this big divide, and it is a parallel universe, um, sometimes intentional, sometimes not, sometimes because of these federal structures and the, you know, carve-outs that have existed and how the, the money flows. Um, and there's not that many bridges between, and there should be more. I mean, PRX itself has tried to be one, so we work with more of the LPFMs and some of the non-commercial stations that aren't necessarily affiliates of the, all the networks. Um, we've been interested in seeing on the video side how things like Digital Bicycle and the Denver Project and PEG Media are, uh, in a similar way are trying to aggregate and distribute using the web that same content. And to the extent that the mission around the content creation and the mission that drives the institutions that are serving that content out to, to the locations, it seems like that's the permeable part that hopefully could create a bridge. I don't know if there's any formal you know, steps within any of the structural reforms that have been taken because they really do exist because of the funding mechanisms in these different worlds, the, the cable carve-outs. Well, I think, the, well, just to, um, the bridge, you know, really has to be um, technological in terms of protocols and sharing mm -hmm. um, and maybe, you know, in terms of incentives to work together. You wouldn't want, I mean, the last thing we need is some sort of huge mammoth, you know, unified, um, centralized public media system that encompassed all these different kinds of ecosystems, but what, what we should see is that they work together and cross-fertilize, especially in local communities, with the out-of-work out of print journalists, right, yeah. who, are, who are trying, who are all sort of driven by a non-commercial public service mission. I, I just would toss in that Free Press has been really pushing the phrasing of new public media at uh, the NAMAC conference, the Media Arts Center, really pushing that as encompassing the media arts centers, the public yeah. access yep. television, really excited to see you guys using the same terminology, yeah. even if it doesn't all overlap directly. Yeah, I, I would absolutely encourage that. Yes. I mean, what is the definition of market failure? And, and, and is that failure in the marketplace or the marketplace itself failing these people as in actively excluding them? Because, I mean, it's obviously using kind of a pejorative term. And so it's a question of how, how did you arrive at that way and what is the accepted definition of that? Uh, does any an economist here want to offer a definition of market failure? I mean, because I mean, you know, I, so I deal in things like carbon trading, yeah. and I can tell you what a technical definition of a failed market is, which was carbon one in Europe, in which they set the allowances wrong, and everybody traded at a certain expectation, and then the next day they announced, oh, by the way, we did a math error. By the way, there's ten times more carbon than you thought, and the price collapsed, right? Because like, what I'm holding is worthless. Why would I buy it? Right. So there's a technical failure of a market <coughs> design. 
But what is your definition? Well, so there, there are two types of market failure that I'm talking about here. Um, one of them, which is the more classic kind of market failure, is where there are externalities. In this case, there are positive externalities of things like investigative journalism, right? It does positive things in our world, but the market doesn't take, it, take them into account. Um, and the, the, uh, uh, th there is no consumer demand for them, right? So in order to generate those positive externalities, you need some sort of external, ex extra market force, whether it's private funding or, or government funding. Um, the other kind of market failure is, is the failure, which is, I think, you know, largely what the 67 Act was talking about. It's talking about, yeah, the, the failure of the market to deliver um, on a uh, to to deliver products that can some some portion of uh, the consumer market demands right so um, and, and it and it's in broadcasting it was because of the sort of two sided advertising market right that your customers are really the advertisers or the underwriters in the case of public media they're not actually the consumers so if advertisers can't aggregate enough consumers that are that are attractive consumers, right, to advertisers, um, then advertisers won't buy the product, even though there are consumers who would actually like it. And, and given and if there were a, um, uh, a if there were price discrimination and all sorts of other um, tools in the marketplace, we might have seen these products delivered. But there was a failure in the marketplace, and that's that. It's that kind of market failure. Um, where we're not talking about positive externalities. We're just talking about goods and services that the marketplace actually demands. If we could get out all the transaction costs and you know um, uh, the other obstacles, um, that I think is is more suspect today because we do have price discrimination in media and we have a long tail and we have a much better functioning media market than we did in 67 that can actually cater to niche markets. So it becomes harder, I think, to identify where the market failures are. And also, well, given that, I mean, does that mean that actually market failure is not a term to use today? That it is kind of a, kind of a classicist, you know, against the man term to use when making an argument like this? Well, no, I still think it's the right, um, first of all, I don't, I don't think it's pejorative. Um, I mean, plenty of, plenty of um, uh, you know, free market enthusiasts and proponents, everyone, accepts that there are times when the market fails, right? We've had a few examples recently. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, so I don't think it's pejorative. Um, it, it's just that the, 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 the market doesn't, doesn't always deliver every, you know, desirable good, goods and services, either desired by consumers or not desired by consumers, but that we think consumers ought to have, right, or that we think ought to exist. Um, but just to give you an example, I mean, there may be so, uh, and this is something that CPB's minority consortia was sort of set up to address. So Pacific Islanders, right, they are not a big enough group um, to support a, a programming market for them, right? It's just, they're just not, it's just not market, it's not viable economically. Um, so the market has failed to produce programming that they actually want. Um, and maybe, you know, they would pay for it. So if we, even if we stripped out sort of inequalities and distri dis distributional issues, they might even be willing to pay for it and able to pay for it. Um, but the market, we haven't put buyer and seller together so properly. So there is a market failure there. Um, so I think there still, there still are some. They're just not as rife and rampant as they were in the 60s when you only had three choices. I think that, that, this just reminds me, there's another, the other feature that the very Berkman kind of critique perhaps on all of this is that, Part of what's been remarkable about the internet is the enabling of the of non-market behaviors, um, individual behaviors, and participation that are creating enormous value. Um, that isn't necessarily even because there's a market failure, but because prior to the availability of the platforms and technology, that kind of behavior never amounted to or evolved into um, the kinds of creativity and innovation and actual real businesses that we now see. Um, public media never would have and didn't create Wikipedia. Um, but it exists, and it's now, you know, a kind of public media. Markets don't by themselves so the common good. But and now, now that the political science is the Nobel laureate in the economy, yeah. I mean, economics. In, in I want to squeeze in a couple more questions. Wait, she does, she does ask oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. In, I'm sorry. In yeah. the, when you say a non-market a non value, what is that value, or what, how do you... Well, you know, so there, the the, uh, this is sort of the, the wealth of networks, um, mm -hmm. Yochai take on things, and if he were here, he would do a much, much better job of it, but um, that there are a variety of incentives and reasons that people participate in things, um, altruism and generosity and mm -hmm. personal behaviors and the things that have, are captured around a table and conversation, that now um, the kind of technology, network technology that helps harness that can enable people to add value based on things that they hadn't before. So, 
Flickr or photo sharing would be I a very good example. Actually oh, <laughs> that's that's actually a much harder thing to do. Which, um, as the list of things that I think Ellen is saying, where we need to be able to actually do some documentation of where you know that value is. That you know, there's entire Yochai's running projects trying to measure that very thing. Is anybody on Yochai's project here? There's, we have a couple of fellows who actually work with him here, so no, it's not. Paul. I just want to talk, question a little bit about the say the Pacific Islander um, uh, uh, context, shall we say. Um, is that a failure of the market or a failure of uh, technology to enable the market? For example, a re traditional radio footprint is a certain number of miles. However, with the internet, you know, you can aggregate a larger amount of content, not content, but listeners via the internet. So you might be able to do Pacific Islander programming mm -hmm. because you can aggregate, you know, um, listeners across the world. I think that's a, a real, I mean, that, that's sort of to the curatorial point. I mean, maybe there's, uh, if, if the investment in curating and aggregating intentionally around areas that are otherwise not being served by the market could answer that issue. You know, that's a great value for a public media role. Um, and perhaps it started today if you were trying to do the minority consortium. So in the public television, they actually fund a dedicated fund for five, five minority consortia groups, I think. If you were starting today saying which are the minority media needs aren't being served by the programming marketplace, you might take a completely different tack around how you'd find, source, curate, and present content that might have nothing to do with content creation. There is a public radio Broadcast basically anything you might hear on BUR, GBH. There you uh, go. Time shifted it for 14 hours the next day. Perfect. Um, and that came out of, I guess, that would be like a market demand. It was licensed in 1995 and it slowly become an NPR station for so long. So let's take two more questions, Rob. So, one of the hot topics is whether the government should bail out journalism, if yes. not newspapers specifically, broader journalists and journalism. How does this kind of feed into your thinking about what is public media and what's not, and does that change how you look at it? Okay. Um, yeah, so, some of those proposals, the, the bailout comes in um, a bunch of forms, some of which are, um, you know, allow uh, newspapers to have nonprofit. Arms, right? Allow um, so sort of tax breaks is one form. Um, so, so some most of them are directed at preserving a some sort of commercial structure for news production. Um, the bailout has also been framed as throwing more money at public media. Um, so, um, obviously, this project intersects with that to the extent that it involves more res resources for public media. But that's why, again, I say it comes back to this foundational existential question of well, what is public media and does it have much to do with the journalism crisis? Um, I think if you look at public broadcasting with the exception of NPR, no, not too much, right? Not doing a lot of accountability. Public broadcasters are not doing a lot of accountability journalism outside of radio. Um, uh, but there is consensus that they ought to be doing more. So then throwing money at public media, refashioned, restructured, and redirected t towards um, that particular market failure or public good. Um, is uh, would make sense, um, but I don't think. Uh, uh, and then on the other question, sort of supporting commercial journalism, I don't think this project has has anything to do with that. It should be uh, Dan Dan Gilmore did a post recently, just in response to one of the free press arguments for um, journalistic subsidies, saying uh, the only subsidy we really need is broadband, um, and that's that. He's framing up one of the count, you know, the very much the counter example to some of these discussions that are the premise of public broadcasting. Where do you need it? Maybe it is around curating. Maybe the infrastructure layer is not where we need further investment. I'm not sure. One more question. Any more? That last one. I'm just curious about the copyright benefits to the public media. What is the situation at the current stage in the States? And uh, the more another question is actually I'm just curious on what's your suggestion to the reform the change of the current copyright benefits. It's from the from extend the coverage of the umbrella of that fair use or just uh, from the source of the funding to, su to, to support those public medias to get those copyrighted works by what way? What's your suggestion? Do you have that? Okay, kind of yeah, I mean the copyright discussion is a whole, its whole own thing. Um, just to, to answer your your factual question about what is what, what do they get yeah. now? Um, 
Uh, there's Section 114 and 118 in the Copyright Act. 114 um, exempts uh, from copyright protection uh, the transmission of audio recordings in programs. So public broadcasting programs can have um, uh, can, can use um, audio recordings without seeking a license for them as part of the program in ways that commercial broadcasters can't. Um, Section 118 is a compulsory license for certain materials and programs. It's published non-dramatic musical works and pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works. Um, uh, so that's a compulsory license. They pay for it, but they pay a certain statutory rate. Um, Can you give an example of like, how this is? Yeah, it just means that in, in and it's particularly um, important in archival, um, uh, when, when public, um, well, it, um, if, if you're making a documentary and you've got a, um, uh, a sculpture in it, right, you don't have to seek a license. Um, you don't have to negotiate a license for that sculpture. You pay a statutory fee. If it's um, sort of a background audio recording, you you have the rights to it. Um, just for broadcast. But just right. But just for broadcasting. So in practice, they have to clear them all anyway because nobody's just broadcasting. Nobody's just broadcasting. So um, <laughs> so so that's so on paper that's what it is. In practice, they have to go back and clear all the rights um, because uh, for any kind of web use, for home video, for. Um, uh, uh, you know, use educational use in schools, etc. And that would be the natural extension, right? right. But but to, but the the sort of the bigger question. So you can imagine, yes, uh, make it not just for broadcasting, make it cover more things. There could be lots of permutations of that. Um, that's on that's that's so public broadcasters, public media entities, and of course this poses a great definitional problem. If you're going to expand the definition of public media, then who gets this benefit, right? Yeah. It becomes quite tricky. Um, and quite, I think, uh, you know, quite contested. Um, but that's on. But that's for public media to use upstream for their upstream components. But what about access to public media content, right? Which is itself copyrighted, and um, and that I think is where um, probably, um, you know, there could be lots of convergence with the work of the Berkman Center on on, on IP reform and other. Um, advocates and advocates for reformed public media because the sort of curatorial and, and sort of the, we're talking about open platforms that provide this curatorial function and ideally you'd want maximal public access to this material. So you'd want it to be fairly open access if not totally open access. Um, and the problem is and the um, incredibly deep complexity here is that the people who make these programs, as much as they might like that, to have subjected all the Creative Commons and make it all open, you know, they're dealing with um, with with documentary footage and and stills and all sorts of rich material that they can't get those kinds of rights to. Um, and so, if you think there's, and this is where you know the Flickr, I, I think those who have sort of the Flickr, the wealth of networks model, think. Isn't everything free? You know, isn't everything that you might want just kind of out there? And can't you just download stuff from Flickr and put it into your documentary? And the answer is, if you think there's value in sort of other kinds of works um, that do depend on these on this content that's copyrighted and not free and not open, um, then you really, on the downstream end, can't have total openness because they can't get it on the upstream end. All right, we're, we're out of time. We're happy to stick around and talk. But thank you all for coming. Thank you.